For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 5D. In this video, we're going to cover the proton proton chain, which is one of the two mechanisms in which hydrogen is fused into helium that takes place inside of stars. I've rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. Now, way back in Stellar Physics 1D, I went over the various nuclear fusion stages in the stellar cores, and I covered in some detail the proton proton chain. But that was a while ago, so let's recap what I went over in that video. Stars, during their main sequence phase, which is most of their life, are made up of roughly 75% hydrogen and 25% helium. They are supported against gravitational collapse by fusion taking place in their cores. And during the main sequence phase, that's hydrogen fusion. So hydrogen fusion takes four protons, which are hydrogen nuclei, and converts them into one helium nucleus, or alpha particle, which is made up of two protons and two neutrons. So the way this works is, you start off with two protons here, they come together and fuse into an H2 nucleus, otherwise called a deuteron. So in this process, a positron is emitted, which converts one of the protons into a neutron. This positron will immediately bump into an electron and annihilate into two photons. The force that is responsible for converting neutrons into protons and vice versa is the weak nuclear force. And anytime you have a weak interaction, you also have to have an emission of neutrinos. So this means that anytime you capture or emit a positron or an electron, a neutrino will also be emitted. Neutrinos pretty much don't interact with anything. Specifically, they only interact with the weak nuclear force. And as is suggested by the name, the weak force is weak, so those interactions don't happen very often. And so essentially, the neutrino streams out through the star without interacting with anything. So this is just energy lost. The energy carried away by the positron is not lost because it annihilates with an electron, converting into photons, which is then absorbed by the material in the star. Okay, so then the deuteron will bump into another proton, and they're going to fuse into a helium-3 nucleus. Then, the helium-3 nucleus will bump into another helium-3 nucleus, which, in this schematic, was made via the same process we just described, but it doesn't have to be. You just need a helium-3 nucleus from somewhere. And these two bump in together, and they fuse into a helium-4 nucleus, an alpha particle, and pop off two protons. The net process is that four protons plus two electrons are converted into a helium nucleus, plus two neutrinos, and I wrote plus six photons, but probably a better way to say it is just plus some energy, because photon number is not a conserved quantity, so writing it as six photons is probably not the best way to do it. The net energy released will be the mass energy difference between the four initial protons and the two initial electrons minus the final alpha particle. And this is about 26.7 MeV. Now remember, part of that is going into neutrinos and that energy is lost. But all this is actually just one branch of the proton-proton chain. It's called the PP1 branch. But there are other branches. So another branch will fork off when you get to helium-3. And this is the PP2 branch. So let's take a look at that. So the PP2 branch diverts once you get to a helium-3. In the PP-1 branch, it bumped into another helium-3. Now, instead of bumping into a helium-3, it's going to bump into a helium-4, and it's going to fuse to beryllium-7. Beryllium-7 is then going to absorb an electron and convert into lithium-7. And recall, as I said, anytime you have electron or positron emission or capture, you also have neutrinos involved. Next, lithium-7 will bump into another proton, and the whole thing will break up into two helium-4 nuclei. Now, you might think here we've created two alpha particles, but remember, we have to put one in initially. So the net is that we've only created one helium nucleus. So that covers the PP2 branch. But actually, there's a third possibility, which is that when you get to beryllium-7, instead of capturing an electron, you divert off to the PP3 branch, 
So let's take a look at that branch now. We start off with beryllium 7, and instead of capturing an electron, as we did in the PP2 branch, we capture a proton. And this makes boron 8. Now, if you're going to study nuclear physics, there's an important fact you should remember, which is that there are no stable nuclei of mass 8. And this accident of nature has all sorts of ramifications. And in particular, we're going to see that this is very important once we get to helium fusion. So, since there are no stable nuclei of mass 8, boron 8 is not a stable nucleus. And it will decay, it will beta decay, by emitting a positron into beryllium 8. But again, we have a nucleus of mass 8. So beryllium 8 is also unstable, and so it will break up into two alpha particles. And again, remember, we haven't created two alpha particles because this whole chain started in the PP2 chain, which required an initial capture of an alpha particle, so we still have a net gain of one alpha particle. If you're finding this video helpful so far, please like and subscribe, maybe share it with a few friends. Now, between these three branches, even though they're all going from converting four protons into one alpha particle, they don't release the same amount of energy. Or better, the energy released in the neutrinos is different, so they don't release the same amount of useful energy, we can say. Meaning that the different branches lose different amounts of energy to the neutrinos. Also, they don't occur at the same rates. And which one will be the dominant branch will depend on the exact temperature and composition of the star. Typically, the dominant branch will either be the first branch or the second branch. So now, let's put all of these branches together. And as we do this, we're going to build a set of mathematical equations to describe all of these processes. To start off, we have two protons come together to make a deuteron, which was an H2 nucleus. In the previous video, Stellar Physics 5C, I went over nuclear reaction rates where I showed that the rate of change of some particle species, which I'm going to call x, is equal to some rate, which I'm calling lambda, times the product of the parent particles. So x is the daughter particle. This is the time rate of change of x, which I'm going to write as x dot. In this case here, x would be d. We're creating a deuteron, and the two parent particles in this case are both protons. This rate, lambda, is actually what makes nuclear physics very difficult. Figuring out this rate is no easy task, and either requires you to find them experimentally, or a very good knowledge of quantum mechanics. In general, these rates are highly dependent on density and temperature, and possibly some other factors. For example, it's important to know if these rates are resonant or non-resonant. If you don't know the difference, I covered that in the previous video, Stellar Physics 5C. So. Getting back to the problem here, we now want to set this up for this process. First off, the number of protons is changing. So the rate of change of the number of protons will be equal to some rate, which I'm calling lambda pp, times the product of the parent particles. Well, the parent particles are both protons. So this is going to be p squared. And there's an extra factor of 2 here because this process destroys two protons. And it's negative because you're destroying the protons. But this also results in the creation of a deuteron at the exact same rate, except that we're only creating one deuteron, so we don't have this factor of two here. And since we're creating it, it's not a negative, it's positive now. Next step, the deuteron captures a proton and converts into helium-3. So this destroys one more proton. So now we have a different rate. I'm calling lambda PD, and the parent particles are a proton and a deuteron. And again, we're losing a proton here. We're also losing a deuteron at the exact same rate. And finally, we're creating a helium-3 nucleus at the same rate. Next step in the PP1 branch, the helium-3 captures another helium-3, creating a helium-4 and two protons. So we're destroying now two helium-3 particles at some rate, which I'm calling lambda-3-3. This will also create two protons, and it will create a helium-4 nucleus. And that covers the PP-1 branch. Now we have to add the PP-2 branch. So for the PP-2 branch, instead of this last step, 
The helium-3 captures a helium-4 and converts into beryllium-7. So at this point, you should be getting the hang of this. We're going to destroy a helium-3 nucleus. We're also going to destroy a helium-4 nucleus. And we're going to create a beryllium-7 nucleus. Next step in the PP2 branch, beryllium-7 will capture an electron and convert into lithium-7. So we now destroy a beryllium-7. Ne here is the number of electrons. In principle, I should also be writing down a differential equation for the number of electrons, but I'm not going to do that here. I just want to show you how to set this up. So I'm just going to do it for the nuclei. So finally, we have to add that this created a lithium-7 nucleus. Lithium-7 will then capture a proton converting into two alpha particles. So we just keep repeating this process. We write down a destruction of lithium-7. This also destroys a proton, and this will create two helium-4 nuclei. And that covers the PP2 branch. Finally, we have the third branch where instead of beryllium-7 capturing an electron, it will now capture a proton and convert into boron-8. So you know what to do. We destroy a beryllium-7, we destroy a proton, and normally we would write down the creation of boron-8, but remember that boron-8 is not stable because there are no stable nuclei of mass-8. So I'm not going to write this down, because boron-8 is immediately going to decay into beryllium-8, which is also unstable, and that's immediately going to decay into two alpha particles. So I'm just going to take those two decays and lump them into one rate, and just say that instead, we've created two alpha particles. And that covers the PP3 branch. Now we've got a pretty complicated set of differential equations that we have to solve. And good luck solving this especially because the hardest part about this is figuring out these rates, because they're not fixed. They are highly temperature dependent. And to make things more complicated, there's actually a fourth branch, which I haven't talked about, in which helium-3 just captures a proton and converts directly to helium-4. The reason I'm not actually including this branch is because it doesn't happen very often. In fact, compared to these two, it happens about one in a million times, so you can safely ignore it. But in principle, it's there. In fact, in principle, there are many ways in which any nuclear reaction can take place. And in principle, you would have to add every single possible branch you could think of. This is called the Feynman rule, which says that anything that can happen will happen. It's really just a law of statistics with large numbers. But to make things simpler, if something very seldomly happens, we just ignore it. It's already complicated enough as it is. Now, this actually looks very complicated, and it is, but we can simplify it by making some assumptions. We're going to assume that some of these nuclei are in what's called equilibrium, meaning that they are being created at the same rate as they're being destroyed. So the total amount of them is always the same. So for example, we can assume that the amount of deuterium is constant. There's just as much deuterium being created as destroyed. Well, if you take a look at this equation, you'll see that that's actually not possible. If this equation is zero, that means that the number of deuterons is constant. So D here is constant. Lambdas are constant, assuming the temperature and density aren't changing. So in order for this whole thing to be zero, that means that P has to be constant. Well, that can't be true because we're converting hydrogen into helium. So why can we make this assumption? Well, while it's true, that the number of deuterons cannot be constant, if you actually look at what the values of these rates, it turns out that the number of deuterons changes very slowly. And when I say slowly, I mean slowly compared to the rate of change of protons and alpha particles. So we're going to take it to be essentially zero, and we can correct for it afterwards if we want to. And in fact, for equilibrium, we're actually going to assume that every single intermediate nucleus between hydrogen and helium is in equilibrium. And when you do this, you're left with two differential equations, one for protons, or hydrogen, and one for helium-4. And if you take a look at this, you'll see that this quantity in brackets is exactly the same as this quantity in the helium-4 equation. So we have that P dot, so the rate of change of protons, is negative 4 times the rate of change of helium, which makes sense. You're taking four protons 
and converting them into one helium nucleus. And this is actually solvable analytically. I'm not going to actually solve it. You can try to do it yourself. Remember that H3 is constant in our equilibrium assumption. So the only thing that's not constant on the right-hand side of these equations is H4. So that's it. Now you know how to calculate the rates for the proton-proton chain. But it turns out the proton-proton chain is not the only way hydrogen can be fused into helium. For stars that are about one and a half times the size of the sun and smaller, they will burn on the proton-proton chain. But there's actually a second way in which hydrogen can fuse into helium, and that's called the CNO cycle, which stands for carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle. I also briefly went over this in Stellar Physics 1D, but we're going to go over it in detail in the next video. So if you found this video interesting and you'd like to see how the CNO cycle works, stay tuned for the next video. Be sure to like and subscribe and click the bell to be notified for future videos. Thanks for watching.